So, good day everybody and thank you for coming here. I noticed that the room is silent, so I guess it's about time to start. Um, we're 10 minutes over time already, um, for which we apologize, but we're anyway happy that you had the patience to come here and to wait. <coughs> so this event is about um, do not track. It's self-regulation enough. Um, it's based in the discussion about the e-privacy directive or directive 2002-58. Um, and some of its more controversial um, articles um, that many people feel maybe aren't adequately implemented. Um, it's also about how such implementation can occur and whether the efforts made by the World Wide Web Consortium in the context of the Do Not Track standard are sufficient um, to um, ensure the proper application of the law and the rights to the European citizens that the legislators have have decided at the European level and at the national level. We have a lineup of distinguished speakers from various interest groups. Um, first of all, Mr. Robert Madeline is the general director of DG Connect, which I assume is formally responsible for the directive. Uh, we have uh, Rob van Eyck from the Data Protection Authority in the Netherlands, who's been working on this issue both at the national level, but also as the Article 29 group representative in the World Wide Web Consortium. Um, as a replacement for Mr. Paul Nemitz from DG Justice, who unfortunately cannot be with us today, we have Nicolas Dubois, who I'm sure will still make an entirely adequate representation of DG Just's workings in this, um, in this issue. And we also have Mr. Stuart Hamilton from the International Federation of Librarians and Archivers, who will be presenting more of um, a librarian point of view on um, how tracking influences reading habits. Um, in addition to this speaker lineup, um, I was specifically requested to give some challenges to the panel from a distinguished set of speakers who are sitting in front. We have Mr. Justin Brookman from the Center of Democracy and Technology, also the co-chair of the Do Not Track Working Group at the W3C. Um, Mr. Walter van Holst, um, who is a representative of uh, the European Digital Rights Initiative at this event, but has also been participating in the W3C discussions and therefore is very knowledgeable on um, the proceedings there. Um, and we have a representative from uh, BEREC, Mr. Ola Bergström. Um, and this is because in about nine to 12 of the member states, the e-privacy directive <coughs> is actually the competence of national regulatory authorities for telecommunications rather than the data protection authorities. And this is part of the reason that the implementation of the directive at the European level um, and also the harmonized interpretation of what the directive means has been such an immense challenge for institutions both at the European level and at the member state level. So I hope with this wide range of views presented, we will walk out of here in about two hours slightly wiser than we came, and perhaps also slightly closer to a solution to the problem of how we ensure that laws that concern human rights in the European Union are actually enforced. Um, and with this short introduction, I wish to leave the word to um, uh, Robert Madeline. Uh, thank you very much for being here, and uh, I hand the floor to you. So thank you very much, Madam Chairman. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. I think that this is, there's never a bad time in the European Parliament to debate how regulation, business, technology, and our values come together. And I want to, since, especially since I'm speaking first, I want to set the scene, the context for the debate that Amalia has just set out a little bit more broadly. And if I start with uh, do not track, it seems to me that why do we worry about tracking? you can see at least three reasons. One is it leads to uh, creepy alignment between the things I think I'm thinking privately and the stuff that comes up in ad banners on my screen. And there you face a challenge similar to other elements of IT innovation. Around robotics, we say there's a, there's a moment in robotics where you go through what robotics experts call the uncanny valley which, which means that if robots look too much like us, people reject them more than if they actually remain on the machine side of reality. And I would suggest that this thing about creepiness or uncanny uh, humanoid behavior 
or an ability to, to read my mind, these are things which, as a society, we just don't want to have. We are human beings, and if it makes us feel uncomfortable, it's a bad thing. I would also argue that, long run, uh, for businesses, it's a bad thing to give me feelings like that, but sometimes in the short term, quarterly profits take over. Secondly, there's a danger, and this goes to the integrity <coughs> of the information base for functioning democracy. There's a risk that if I'm being tracked, people will be able to curate my environment, to boost my prejudices, to deny me uh, full data in areas of concern, and that as a result, I won't be seeing a true picture of the world, and so whatever I think will not be the truth. And in both respects, I think what's going on is we worry that the system is gaming us. We worry that we have become more vulnerable because of the empowerment that data and internet access combine to give us. So the first thing I would say is we shouldn't assume that do not track is a small techy regulatory issue. It's a very good paradigm of the different futures that the internet and data technologies can bring us and they're not all good. I believe that the future is potentially with technology better and one of my frustrations would be that somehow we're trying to extract value in the short term and delay, dilute and divert <coughs> regulatory discussions and that as a result we're failing to move fast enough down the motorway to a better future. The second thing I would talk about is self-regulation. Um, people sometimes invite me to this sort of panel because they expect me to say self-regulation is good, but actually the reason I work on self-regulation assiduously in my three uh, commission avatars in trade negotiations, in health and consumer protection and policy, and in now the IT sphere, is that I believe that self-regulation like law is good if it's done properly. And I think in Europe we at the moment are the victims of a polarized debate where it's what we call in English a boo-hurrah debate. Self-regulation is good or it's bad. And actually what we need is a slightly more evidence-based middle ground about what can make a self-regulatory, a voluntary corporatist, a corporate intervention effective in achieving goals that society has set. Uh, in the follow-up to the last so-called CSR communication, the Commission asked me to coordinate the development, which was one of the goals of that communication, of principles which, taken together, are a best practice blueprint for self and co-regulation. And <clears throat> with the help of some of those in this room, we were able as a Commission to adopt and publish those principles. And we've now established a community of practice, which you're all very welcome to join if you're interested in self-regulation, either as academics or practitioners or, or, or decision makers. And the community of practice's purpose is to uh, curate and further improve the principles. Because one of the truths you can see about self-regulation is that it is an emergent practice. Uh, the, the, the truths lying underneath these principles are very simply put. Firstly, self-regulation will work if but only if you ask all the stakeholders, what are we doing this for? You can't set the goals in a smoke-filled room and then do good self-regulation. You'll be aiming at the wrong target. Secondly, self-regulation will work if and only if it is accountable. You say what you're trying to achieve, you have some indicators about how you're progressing, and you frankly and honestly report those indicators with a degree of objective uh, accounting or monitoring which is sufficient for your audience and proportionate to the cost of the business you're regulating. And thirdly, it will work if we all agree that it's a human endeavor like any other, so the first attempt will not be 100% successful and we keep building from that. Um, and I think the short conclusion I would draw here is that if you look at the DNT endeavor, it doesn't quite tick all of those boxes. So self-regulation can be enough, but it's not, you know, it, it, as the Irishman said, we shouldn't have started exactly from where we started. That doesn't mean that the W3C uh, process is, as of today, flawed, but it's a slight handicap on the process.
The final point I would make is about e-privacy, since, as you say, I am uh, supposedly in charge of that. E-privacy is a, the e-privacy directive is a great example that the base case against which to compare self-regulation is not perfection. Legislation, as Bismarck said, is like making sausages. We all know with the recent horse meat scandals that Europe is a, a heavily regulated food space, but we still can't make sausages right. And legislation can be the same. I mean, I, I did not participate in that legislative process, but all of you who follow the privacy directive closely will know that the, the plain man's reading of the preamble as against Article 5 is such a dog's dinner that actually it's very hard to make the legislation work either. So against that background, and the, probably this is the only bit that directly addresses the reason I was um, invited, yes, I think self-regulation can be enough. I think DNT really matters because society really wants something there, and if we don't fix it, we'll stumble on from one internet-phobic issue to another. And I believe that the, the question, whether it's self-regulation or legislation, is can we do it better? Thank you. So I would like to thank Robert Madeline for um, um, that intervention. Um, I thought we could immediately move on to some of the experiences from inside of the Do Not Track working group. Uh, Mr. Rob Van Eyck has been representing the Article 29 group there for um, a long time. And uh, so at the one hand, we have the perspective from outside of the working group and now uh, Mr. Panayik, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, thank you, Mr. Madeline, as well, um, for setting the stage for this panel discussion. Um, I, however, uh, do not agree totally that Do Not Track has been in the center of the self-regulatory uh, discussion we have had in the EU. Um, and I'll try to, to make that argument in this short introduction. Uh, my main message basically is threefold. Um, first, Innovation is fine, digital marketing is fine, um, advertising is fine, but the law uh, sets restrictions. Um, legal requirements are not complicated. Uh, they're about transparency and user control. And in the U DU, do not track means do not collect without my consent. And the second point is that the technical requirements are not complicated either. The technical requirements for devices and software in devices are such that the consent of a user may be expressed by using appropriate settings in a browser or other software and devices. The third point is that if industry wants to play ball, it is time to innovate now and take consent seriously. Uh, and that can be done through a user-centric design. Uh, let me interest, illustrate the essence of a user-centric design of new technology with a quote from McLuhan, as a Canadian philosopher. He expressed the nature of technology as an extension of the human being. And in case of tracking, the browser is an example of such an extension. Orthog orthogonal to this user-centric design is the design out in the in advertising ecosystem that brought us here today. It is very different from a user-centric design. And to illustrate this uh, essence, I will quote Latour, a French contemporary philosopher. It is as if the inner workings of our private worlds have been pried open because their inputs and outputs have become thoroughly traceable. This ties to the creepiness that Mr. Madeline was uh, addressing as one of the three do not track issues. This quote from Latour, illustrates a non-user-centric design because it reflects the intrusiveness and possible cruelty connected to the invasion of one's personal privacy when subjected to a data collection practices without consent. The key for innovation lays within Recital 66 of the Directive 2009-136-CC, which amended the e-privacy directive. It reads, where it is technically possible and effective in accordance with the relevant provisions of Directive 9546CC, which is a general data protection directive, the user's consent to processing may be expressed by using the appropriate settings of a browser or other application. 
if implemented well, do not track may initiate a granular dialogue with a server and a browser, and do not track provides the technical building blocks for an automated and granular dialogue based on the expressions of a user's wish wanting to be tracked or not. If implemented well, do not track could do better than the pesky dialogue boxes we see out on the web every day. So to sum up my introduction, first point is the EU law sets restrictions. It's do not track without consent. Second point is the tactical answer is simple. The essence of user control lays in a user-centric design of new technology. And third, it's time for industry to innovate and take consent seriously and incorporate do not track squarely within the self-regulatory framework. Thank you. Thank you for um, that perspective. Um, we have now a speaker from um, DG Justice, the part of the European Commission that is normally responsible for the data protection regulation. So, um, because the e-privacy directive um, is under DG Connect, and um, data protection in general is under DG Just, and we also have these um, irky problems of competences in the member states. I am particularly excited to hear what uh, Mr. Nicolas Dubois uh, can make as observations on this issue. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for, for this introduction. And as, as uh, was said at the beginning, I am replacing last minute my director of Pol Um Well, I was brainstorming yesterday afternoon about uh, what, what I should say. Uh, in, in, in this panel and, and looking to many, um, to many uh, do not track related papers. Uh, um, uh, I have not, um, well, what I will do in this intervention is say how it relates to, to legislation and, and as Rob has said, there, there are some links to legislation which create constraint to, to uh, what do not track could be. But um, just, just before, before going to that direction uh, and explaining the interaction with, with the general data protection regulation, um, as an introduction, um, so uh, looking to do not track, what is simple in do not track is the technical specification. All the rest is very complicated. That's, that's what I, I learned from, from looking to, to, to papers uh, uh, yesterday. The, the, the technical specification is very simple. You send a signal saying that you don't want to be tracked, and um, and you have to and and uh, web providers, web service providers have to take that signal into account, and it's now even in, in a law in California, which is uh, very simple uh, as well. It says that the, the the online providers have to say what they do with that signal, and the the protocol is even sophisticated a bit that the website can also automatically. Uh, make a reply to that signal. So that's, that's simple. Um, where it uh, becomes complicated is uh, what is the effect of this? Uh, there, uh, there are widely uh, diverging views. Uh, what does do not track mean? Do the, does it mean do not share tracking data? So does it mean uh, do not use tracking data for marketing? Does it mean avoid profiling? All these questions are um, not so clear. So the scope of do not track, is it something that applies to uh, uh, advertising only, or is it something that is much broader and that is more generally related to the secret of communication? That question, a uh, big debate. Um, is uh, do not track something that, that, uh, that will uh, kill marketing? Uh, that's what uh, people said when Microsoft and all browser manufacturers said, well, um, if you ask me what the best uh, setting is, is to send a do not track signal. So, so by default, and then see, and then the advertising industry said, well, it's going to kill our business. So is do not track about killing the advertising business or uh, creating um, imbalances uh, within that market? All, all this question, or is do not track about profiling? You can track a bit but not too much, or, uh, is, uh, or is the question of first and third party relevant? Meaning, uh, if you take it from the secret of communication perspective, when you have a bilateral communication, it's obvious that that's normal, and when there's a third party, 
that uh, snooks in or, or, or takes uh, elements from that conversation, then it's a third party, and that third party has no right to, to listen to that conversation. So, so um, there are um, complex political and societal issues around do not track and, and, a, and a simple technology. So looking to, to how it, it interacts with, with the, our, our rules, uh, the, the law we have today, and the law we're going to have in the future with the data protection reform. Um, first, um, as, um, as Rob said, and I will not come back to this, the e privacy directive, depending on how it's interpreted, creates some restriction to it. Why? Because the e privacy directive is about the secret of communication, that's Article 5. And then in that Article 5, uh, it was added in, in the discussion a few years ago uh, some points uh, about, about cookies um, which, which tend to, to say that, that uh, you cannot uh, store uh, information on users' uh, devices and you cannot do this, especially if it's for the purpose of monitoring what they do. So um, the, the approach in the data protection reform is is, is a bit different. There are no uh, do not do this or do not do that in the data protection reform, and I want to be very clear on, on that. It's not about uh, do's and don't. It's about doing things in a way that uh, respects uh, individual rights to, 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 uh, to privacy. And um, so uh, what, what the data protection reform does, and it does it for the do not track as well because tracking is, is processing personal data, is that it uh, creates rights for individual and a particular right that is relevant in, in the context of, of tracking is, is the right to object there is uh, from uh, the history of, of direct marketing, a right to object to, to direct marketing, which is in the current directive, which are in, in laws for a long time. And this would obviously apply uh, as well in, in the context of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of tracking. So first, people have a right to object. Uh, the second thing that uh, the uh, regulation says is that uh, if you do profiling, you can do profiling, you can do as much profiling as you want, but uh, if it's likely to have uh, negative effects on, on, on individuals, then uh, there are some restrictions. And also, if it uh, relates to, uh, to uh, sensitive data, so uh, data about health, data about uh, uh, whatever, uh, the sens any sensitive data, um, it, it needs to be, um, there need also to be uh, ad additional safeguards. So that is uh, 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 the way uh, it is framed in the regulation. And, and so uh, I would like to point out that it's a bit uh, different from, from doing do not track or, or not, or, 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 or it's not prohibiting tracking as such. So that's, uh, I think, very important to, to understand. The, the last point um, I wanted to, to make is, is to say that um, uh, we, uh, we, we, we do not, so, so as long as, as those, the requirements from the regulation are met, it, it's possible to, to do marketing uh, and to have uh, marketing activities, including by, by uh, uh, processing profiles, because a normal profile would not, uh, would not uh, have adverse effects on, on individuals. And I think in the, in the parliament compromise or on the regulation, this is made uh, even clearer. Now coming to, to the topic of today or on self-regulation, uh, what I want to say is that um, the data protection reform moves a lot of uh, the current ex-ante uh, verification step to ex-post. And it opens a lot to uh, uh, the drawing up of codes of conduct and the uh, putting in place certification mechanism. And there are two things that we think, uh, as, as has been said, doing proper self-regulation is very difficult. It's, uh, we're currently doing, uh, uh, together with, with uh, DG Connect, a code of conduct on cloud computing. It's, it's very delicate uh, discussions and do not track. We, we've seen it's, it's gone in all directions. It's very delicate discussions. 
but we think that our having a, a, a single law in Europe to base uh, on will ease self-regulation processes because instead of having to make sure that you comply with each of a, on any of the single laws in Europe, you will have to, to make sure yes, that you comply with one within your, your self-regulatory environment. And, um, and um, we think we cannot succeed um, regulating properly uh, data protection with self-regulation. And that's why we put so much emphasis into it uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in the data protection reform or, or co-regulation, I would say. Well, I, I will give you an example that, that struck me. I was looking um, yesterday in my brainstorming exercise to uh, the self-regulation in the field of payments, uh, you know, Visa card and so on. And I looked to all the rules and it's uh, 1,200 pages on uh, how it works to you know, your credit cards, all the situations that can happen and how it's regulated and when do you need consent, when you don't and so on. And so we cannot, with, um, with the institution we have, agree on 1,200 pages of, of detailed rules. So we need other places to, to, to discuss this. And that's why we believe that we should have an horizontal instrument on data protection, the data protection reform, and that building on this instrument there should be uh, sectoral codes of conduct uh, uh, on certification mechanism and so on that will explain how the rules are applied in this or that context. And it's perfectly possible to make a do not track uh, self-regulatory process that, that is compliant with, with the current regulation. So thank you very much and sorry for being so long and um, I'm passing. So the last speaker um, for our introductory panel is Stuart Hamilton. Uh, who's a librarian, and librarians having the duty to preserve our cultural heritage and make it accessible to people are often in member states also obliged not to track and profile reader habits because um, it's previously been considered that um, the gathering of knowledge and formation of your own political, social or cultural opinions is something which is very private and which you should not have often public institutions engage with. Um, that is bound to bring a lot of interesting challenges for librarians in the context of e-books, which are of course often presented on electronic devices and um, therefore also often tracked. And I'm very happy you could make it here. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Amelia. And I think you've done a pretty good job of doing my introduction in your introduction. Um, this week I've told a few people I was coming down here um, and a lot of them have said, well, why are librarians going down to a debate on do not track legislation? I doubt many of you will have heard of my organisation, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, or IFLA, but I think all of you will have used libraries at some point. Uh, within Europe, we have um, 65,000 public libraries. Over 100 million people use them in Europe in the last 12 months. And for 1.9 million Europeans, they're actually the only place where they can get free access to the internet. Um, my organization is, is the worldwide representative organization that looks after libraries and the interests of their users. There's actually one point, uh, there's one in six people on the planet who have a library card. So I think I've been invited here today to give a bit of a user perspective on some of the issues we've got in front of us. IFLA, my organization, develops the international standards and policies for libraries. And these sorts of issues, data protection, uh, particularly are increasingly on the agenda um, for librarians and we actually have to understand quite a great deal of law in our day-to-day -day jobs in order to be able to function properly. Um, there's a few things that we're looking at recently and obviously the, the privacy environment post Edward Snowden is one of them and I think it's important to state at the outset that, that privacy is extremely important to librarians. We want to protect the privacy of our users, we want to make sure that they can um, read uh, and access their information without anybody looking over their shoulder. I should point out that librarians in the United States were one of the first groups to actively push back against Section 215 of the Patriot Act. So we have some degree of form in this area when it comes to sort of activism and taking principled stands. But of course that's kind of government tracking and we're here today to talk a little bit about commercial tracking, although I don't want to completely separate the two and I'll come back to that. Um, at IFLA, as I said, we believe firmly that an individual's freedom of expression is affected by their right to privacy. Uh, and for me, Do Not Track is all about trying to make sure that people are not looking over your shoulder as you're surfing the internet. We have a very clear policy document on this, our internet manifesto, 
which states that libraries and information services should respect the privacy of their users and recognise that the resources they use should remain confidential. So we take a very principled stand. But of course, in this debate, a lot of our principles are going to come up against the reality of life on the internet. Um, with the context of DNT, we're talking about the balance between privacy and the ability of commercial organisations to track online behaviour in order to target advertising or sell more goods. So librarians know that activities in the library cannot take place independently of this situation and of course many of our users will use Google, will use Facebook, will be using our services to engage in online commerce and we fully understand that the ability of companies to provide services for free um, is based on their ability to utilise personal data. But we also know that users and people in general don't like being tracked and We've seen several studies, particularly from the US, that show that people oppose tracking. We know that online behavioural tracking, which I think we're talking about here, is in fact just one form of tracking. Amelia mentioned e-readers, and I'm sure we're going to get into that. Uh, but there's also all sorts of other things going on here, the Facebook like button, uh, for example. From our perspective, when it comes to how we view this issue, we would agree with a 2011 paper from Stanford University, which stated that... Um, when it comes to um, expectations of users, um, an entity acts in a first-party capacity if a user reasonably expects to interact with it. It acts in a third-party capacity if the user does not. So our fundamental position on this would be that we want to see any tracking as consistent with a user's reasonable expectations and not expanded beyond this without users having further say in the matter. Um, we've talked a little bit about self-regulation. I want to, to focus just my main point on really something which I think we should be looking at to complement whatever solution we find uh, to this problem and to talk about how consumers or users can regulate themselves in this context and how libraries can help. Um, we're talking here about training users and I think Commissioner Cruz put it when she talked about the DNT but in a slightly different context. It's about empowering the citizen. In a do not track context, do consumers actually understand the difference between first party and third party cookies? Do they understand what's happening to their information when they're surfing and the extent to which their information seeking is being monetized? Do they understand how to protect their privacy across devices, including e-readers? Uh, and do they understand exactly how important all of this is becoming? In many school libraries around the world, it's school librarians who are now training uh, and, and educating youngsters in how to protect their privacy online. Uh, and we have many different types of public libraries that begin to offer services like laptop doctors, particularly in Finland, where you can go into a library and get advice on how to protect your privacy across devices. I think if we are in agreement that the do not track um, situation should be implemented, if we think that do not track is a good thing, then the EU might consider using libraries to actually help educate citizens about their online privacy. Um, a new European Commission report just published in November reveals that public libraries in the 20, 27 member states before Croatia make up 51% of all e-inclusion actors. So you have these resources. Uh, you have 65,000 public libraries in Europe, and I think they should be utilised. Um, just to get onto the question, uh, is self-regulation enough? Well, I'm moving a little bit more into a a personal opinion, much like Nicholas, I did a, a lot of sort of brainstorming yesterday. Um, I've obviously come into contact with the lead role that Mozilla has played in the last year. Um, and was interested to see that by November, only 18% of Firefox users have turned on Do Not Track in the UK and only 12% worldwide, which I don't think is a huge uptake. Um, and this is obviously because at present, um, honouring the DNT uh, Do Not Track is voluntary. This is an interesting problem. I, I, I was interested in reading about individual websites not being required to respect it. Um, obviously, I think here success is going to depend on the extent to which websites comply with the instruction, and even just having DNT in browsers is not going to do any good if it's ignored. Um, if it was a legal obligation to honour this, what would happen? And I think it's been mentioned here the main objections seem to come from the advertising sector who believe it would adversely affect their bottom line, or... I was interested to find out, as the Direct Marketing Association put it in 2012, um, 
it would actually restrict one of the most important values of civil society, which they defined as marketing. Um, I, was, I think that the researchers at Stanford in their paper as well um, raised a good point for me where they think that the effect on online advertising expenditure would actually be minimal as third-party behavioural advertising only seems to account between 4% and 7% of the overall online marketing environment in the US and I think broadly speaking that's the same in the EU as well. Um, and they also suggest that um, actually if um, you have to tick the box on your preferences to implement do not track then the uptake is likely to be far from complete which means there's still going to be a market for our uh, uh, um, civil liberties defenders in the marketing um, sector. So I think that there's, there's probably quite a great deal of space still if we made this uh, absolutely uh, obligatory for online advertising to continue. And I'll just make a final point if I may. Uh, I mentioned earlier on that we were talking here about commercial uh, activities. I'd like to mention um, the non-commercial aspects in this. Um, we're about seven months into the revelations uh, from Edward Snowden. I'm not entirely certain yet the questions about the involvement of the commercial sector have really been answered in um, the degree to which they've been making information available to our security services. Um, when I read about the November leaks about the NSA's plans to discredit individuals through electronic surveillance of their online activity, I wonder whether the absence of do not track legislation actually makes us the, the NSA's job easier. I don't know the answer to this, it's just one of many questions on uh, the slate at the moment. But I think if commercial companies are obliged to supply information in response to government demands, then um, there's a fairly ominous um, set of circumstances that could come out there. I, I would personally be in favour of a world where we try to make sure that information on our online surfing is kept to the minimum, or at least make sure that people have the skills to do something about themselves. And I think, as Rob said, transparency and user control. That's what I'm interested in. So thank you for these uh, four very interesting presentations. Uh, we're actually um, good on time. Um, so personally, I was interested to find some of the institutional difficulties manifesting themselves already um, in the panel between DG Connect and DG Just. Um, I hope that we can continue the discussion to um, think more carefully about how different institutions can work together to implement European law in a way which is transparent and um, relevant for users. But I was requested leading up to this panel to um, provide one set of commentators who aren't represented of the panel an opportunity um, to speak about their points of views. We have with us the co-chair of the Do Not Track Working Group, Mr. Justin Brookman. Um, if you could uh, keep your presentation to about four minutes, um, we would be very happy to hear your points of views and your challenges for the um, panel presentations we have already heard. Very much welcome. Sure, I can probably keep it um, shorter than that. I actually had, primarily had a question for the, the, other, the panelists. Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to work out in my mind the, the significant, significant gap between what I think Do Not Track is designed to accomplish, which is, supposed to be, which is relatively narrow, and existing EU law, whether it be the Data Protection Directive or the E-Privacy Directive, which I think already covers a lot of these issues that we're, we're talking about. Um, just some historical perspective, Do Not Track was designed as a U.S. solution to a U.S. problem, which is why we don't have privacy law in the United States. Um, we tried to use existing law um, again, uh, to, to push back on, on behavioral advertising at the same time that Europe was passing the e-privacy directive. So EPIC, um, uh, the U.S. privacy group EPIC, sued DoubleClick in federal court and lost. And the, the court said, no, there's nothing illegal about what, what, what happens here. Uh, privacy groups petitioned the Federal Trade Commission <coughs> to go after DoubleClick um, and other behavioral advertising companies. Um, nothing. And so for years, uh, U.S. privacy groups talked to the, 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 the advertisers and said, you know, this should be an opt-in. You should have to opt-in to, to cross-site behavioral advertising. And they said, no, we don't have to. There's no law here. Um, and then finally we said, well, okay, well, at least maybe there should be an opt-out. Um, but it has to be a global opt-out from, 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 from cross-site behavioral tracking. And so in 2007, a bunch of private, U.S. privacy groups got together and said, well, um, there needs to be some sort of like global opt-out solution. We're going to call it Do Not Track. And if a consumer signs up for it, much like we have a Do Not Call list in the United States, um, they would be, they would be uh, able to turn off uh, behavioral tracking. But it seems like a much more narrow 
issue than, than what I think uh, European law would require. It's a, an affirmative opt-out, it's just cross-site behavioral tracking, whereas uh, the way I look at the, the e-privacy directive 504, it seems like you almost need an opt-in for all um, data collection. Uh, so the, the, the Federal Trade Commission uh, in, in, in 2010, um, after years of, the, of, the, of industry not really fixing the problem themselves, said, you know what, yeah, we do need this, this relatively narrow um, uh, solution on, on, on do not track. And that's what the, the, do, the do not track working group in W3 has really been set up to do. It's, a, it's just about third party tracking. Um, it's not about first party data collection. It's not, it's not, it's not going to solve, I don't think, um, the window shade issue in Europe. Whenever you go to a website in Europe, a little thing comes down you're consenting to cookies. It's not remotely designed to address that. So even if do not track were fully implemented, it still seems that there's this gap in the law that's not being addressed. So I'd be curious to hear what, what maybe I'm just missing, you know, how do not track can really implement Article 5.4 or even European privacy law in general. So it takes us back to my, to my uh, respectful comment about how legislation is an imperfect process like every other. Uh, neither I personally nor many of the commentators, including the rapporteur responsible for the directive, would agree that the directive requires opt-in. So if you don't know what the law means, you're not going to find it very easy to implement. But I suppose that the question of Mr. Brookman was uh, not if the legislation of Europe is inadequate, um, but whether um, the self-regulation that is currently taking place in the World Wide Web Consortium is sufficient to fulfill the requirements of the legislation. Uh, we must assume, and I personally feel like assuming that the wisdom of my institution in representing the European public um, is sufficient. For if it weren't, I would delegitimize myself and the work of all of my colleagues. So that which we have decided is the law and should be implemented and how can we move on to implement the decisions that we have made in our wisdom and in our capacities as democratically elected representatives of our public. And so we were talking about English literature before and there's another reference from Charles Dickens that springs to mind about the law but I won't quote it here. I, I agree as a, as a legal positivist that the law is the law but in this case I mean the answer to the question can either corporate compliance or self-regulatory discourse or anything in between deliver what the law says is complicated in an area when the preamble and the text seem to point in different directions. The rapporteur says this was the drafter's intention. Other people disagree with the published opinions of the rapporteur and the Court of Justice has not yet given us any guidance. So we are in a delicate area where it's not just the business model and the technologies that are emergent, also the the, the popular will is emergent. My, my personal take on this is that what I mean by consent varies by context. If I go into a pub, I consent to watching people drinking alcohol. It's okay if you are a teetotaler not to go into a pub. It's not okay, to, well, it's, it's, it's legitimate because it's a free continent to say I think all pubs should be closed, um, either all the time or on Sunday morning. But I think that the, or on Friday afternoon, but I think that the, we're in that sort of debate in European society today. We all want enough privacy and control. I think that's the point that business models fail to integrate and the legislature is trying to help to guide both the citizen and business innovators towards a point of balance in, in, in society where I get the benefits of the internet and the control that makes me feel comfortable. We're not there yet. Uh, can we get there with a, with a single text, whether it's the currently applicable directives or the future regulations? I don't know. We're trying. And I think uh, just, to, um, just to correct somewhat the impression that Nicola and I would disagree, I mean, I think that the positive formulations in the, uh, in, in the, in the current draft on the table are a very good step in the right direction. But I, we, we just don't know whether a consumer the average consumer, the, the 508 million consumers in Europe, whether they think that consent means clicking something or setting a browser or just going on a website. I mean, frankly, most people who go on the internet expect to be advertised to. When I walk, when I go shopping, whether it's in Brussels or London, I expect the CCTV to be tracking me. We don't have at the moment 
guidelines for CCTV either. So this whole issue of privacy is very, very important, but I don't think that any single answer has emerged yet, which seems to me future-proof and effective. So I think there's, there's a problem, that's clear. But I don't think that, it, I don't think we have the, the means to accurately legislate the answer because society is uh, fluctuating. And that's one of the reasons why something like self-regulation, which is faster to market except when it's bureaucratized um, and improvable over time, can be an effective intervention at a time when we're not quite sure what we want and we're not quite sure what the technologies are. So I, I, I think it's, it, it, it's a very important point, but, but the positivist approach doesn't save you because you still have a piece of law that the, the drafters can't agree on the meaning of. Do we have any other takes from the panel on uh, Mr. Buckman's question? From Mr. Blake? Yeah, coming back to the um, uh, limited approach that we've been taking within the do not track and whether that's useful within the European context. I think we, we've heard that depending on the context, um, we're dealing now with the sensitivity of, 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 of what's happening within that context and uh, for the legal requirement, uh, either whether a, a right to refuse needs to be offered or whether you need a prior consent before collecting the data. And uh, th those are the two extremes within the scale. And if you look at where we are within the do not track debate, it's um, on the technical document which contains building blocks that have been designed such that they are useful both within the US context but also within the EU context. Because in the end, it's about trying to answer that question whether depending on the sensitivity, uh, sensitive nature of the data, and a right to re uh, offer a f um, uh, a right to refuse needs to be offered or whether you need to ask consent of the user. And I think the uh, protocol that has been designed now does contain a lot of the elements that we need to be able to address both of these functions. So as a second challenger to the panel, um, I invite um, Walter von Holst to make um, comments and observations. Please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've been on the W3C working group for almost two years now. And from a perspective of achieving anything meaningful uh, that equals self-regulation, it's a complete and utter disaster. It nonetheless is probably a good process to get to a good protocol to express certain preferences, as Rob just said. Um, I have a few questions and remarks for most of the panelists on a per panelist basis, and I'll start with, with Mr. Hamilton. Uh, first of all, you mentioned uh, e-books, and um, in a way, as far as there is any consensus in the working group on what do not trick means, um, most of the participants are of the opinion that out-of-band consent overrides any do not track signal. And there has been analysis by the EFF of the terms and conditions of most e-book readers. And over 90% of those terms and conditions say we are allowed to collect your reading habits for the purpose of improving our services, whatever that may mean. So by and large, if the current do, uh, do not track effort is continuing on the way it is, uh, it would mean that it does not apply to e-books in any way, shape or form. Another one is you mentioned a relatively low uptake. Uh, the, in your, from your perspective, relatively low uptake actually uh, made the advertisers turn around and demand further restrictions on what they consider, and that makes it almost perverse, is most of the debate is not so much about do I get consent for tracking, but is the dissent I receive informed dissent, which is quite exactly the opposite of what European uh, legislation says. And, uh, and as well to the party discussion, first and third party, right now the protocol assumes that anyone involved in the, let's say, conversation between the browser and the website, or the e-reader and, and whatever server there is, um, understands their position. Uh, right now the protocol does not allow uh, or does not contain any obligation for any of the parties to say, I think I'm a first or a third party. Furthermore, 
the first or third party distinction is still up for grabs after two years of discussion about that. Um, I'm getting more to the question bit, and it's more uh, for Mr. Dubois and uh, Open Eight. Given that most DPAs are in consensus that tracking browser habits or browsing habits across various contexts um, is in no way justified by what uh, we call a legitimate interest. How come, and if even the English DPA, which is not usually accused of being the most hawkish DPA out there, uh, agrees that it is not a legitimate interest to collect data across various contexts. How come there has been no zero enforcement so far of the current data protection directive? I mean, we're, th this is a relatively separate issue. You mentioned yourself this is about data processing as well, not only about cookies. We hear about talking about processing of data across a great deal of parties, uh, across a great deal of contexts, in which it's almost impossible to keep out sensitive data. And my question to those two is, uh, is uh, how come it has not been enforced the, the just the current rules. Um, which gets me to Mr. Madeleine. Uh, you said that uh, you mentioned a few criteria for self-regulation for being done properly. And I actually think the W3C effort ticks most of the boxes you mentioned. Um, there's a, all stakeholders are there. It's actually the problem there's no progress. Because the stakeholders are, some of them have diametrically opposed interests. And some of the stakeholders in, represent fundamental human rights and others merely commercial interests. And um, it's mostly ac accountable, it's mostly incremental process. And given that this process mostly ticks your boxes, I'm wondering what have been or what are your criteria for this process to have a meaningful result? At what point will you say, I'm no longer going to wait for the outcomes of this process? And what will be your answer if I tell you right now it's very unlikely that the DNT process will result in anything about compliance but only about the protocol? Is that sufficient from your perspective? And even more so, this process has been about dissent, not about consent. So I think under the Data Protection Directive, regardless of any uh, lack of clarity on the e-privacy directive, is a requirement given the lack of legitimate interest. So. Those are my challenges to the panel. Thank you. So I would then first invite uh, Mr. Dubois and uh, Mr. Van Eyck to respond to the first set of questions from Mr. Van Holst. Okay. Uh, me, um, I, I, I want to point out that uh, you're asking about the enforcement of, of the data protection directive. And the way it works is that the enforcers of the data protection directive or the, its national transposition are the data protection authorities. So it's not us. So I don't want to wash my hands, but that, that I, I could do so. Um, uh, 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 what we can do is we can have infringement procedures uh, against uh, member states as a commission. And there are some ongoing, but, but not on, on this particular issue. That's uh, one point. Um, so, so uh, and, and I'm not sure there has not been any enforcement of, of the data protection directive. It, it depends on countries. Uh, it, it also needs to be taken into account that though the, the directive was done in 95, uh, its transposition took a massive amount of time. If you look, the French law transposing the directive only arrived in 2004 for the main law or for the implementing legislation then later, and for the sanction uh, part of it, then again later. Same in the UK, uh, you have the, the UK law, which, which is from 98, I believe, but the enforcement part was done in 2008, and all this um, takes time. So uh, it's true that might be that the Commission might have not been diligent enough in uh, uh, ensuring that that member states would would implement it, but uh, I, I let the enforcement part to to be replied by uh, by Hop. But but I, I would disagree that there's no enforcement of data protection law by by DPAs uh, uh, these days. I, I think some sanctions uh, on, on other topics are making the headlines almost every week. So so I, I would disagree with with that, that statement. What I would like to add to, uh, to Nicholas' answer is that 
Uh, we need to make a distinction between the, the local players, the companies that just operate within the country and develop their own uh, technology, and the more globally operating companies, of which uh, a lot of them have their home uh, uh, res uh, uh, base in uh, California. Um, so I, I do see uh, some um, local enforcements which will not uh, uh, make it to the first stage uh, on the news. Um, and the problem with the more um, uh, coordinated approach that's necessary to um, act upon uh, the global players is that uh, that coordinated approach is, is, is a rather new thing and uh, the DPAs are really uh, trying to work together on a few big cases. And uh, what you see as well is that part of the discussion on the data protection review, um, that one-stop shop has been a very important element. If I may add strong sanction, and you saw that the parliament e even increased the sanction, so I, I think the, the point you're raising is, is duly taken care of in the new regulation. Both from a scope perspective and, and from a sanction perspective, it should be much easier to enforce. And, and we're thankful for, for the support of the MAPS here uh, uh, on this uh, during the discussion in parliament. Uh, let me clarify this a bit. Um, tracking is mostly done by setting cookies beacons, browser fingerprinting. This all involves uh, getting a, another participant in the, the conversation, as Mr. Hamilton put it, between the, the user and, and, and the server. And if you look at it from a data protection perspective, this involves sharing personal data with a third party without prior consent, and that third party does not have a data processing agreement. Furthermore, most of those third parties are based outside the European Union or at least the data is being transferred to outside the European Union. So we have at least three areas in which these practices continuously violate the Data Protection Directive and the local implementations, which do not differ on these three subjects I just mentioned. So regardless on how hasty or uh, slow the local implement national implementations have been, there are clear violations of already standing European law here. Uh, as regards the, the main uh, the, the, the main operator of, of uh, such advertising, it's been already uh, sanctioned by two data protection authority earlier this year for, for related issues, and it's going to be and it's there's still ongoing investigation within four. So, so I agree with your point that there are violation of the law, but I disagree with the fact that they're not sanctioned. They are sanctioned, but it takes time. We all know that the speed at which laws uh, are made uh, is slow, and that, as was said, uh, when you have a, 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 a dispute with a global company and you have small data protection authorities, it takes time to build a fight. Yeah, and you also have to take into account that um, the, the, the fine always comes at the end of the whole pr investigation process. And because um, you also, in this such a process, you come up with your findings, you need to uh, receive the reaction, and it, it just takes months. And that doesn't mean that there are no enforcement actions currently going on at the moment. They just have not been disclosed yet. I can see Walter wants to, to come back on that. But um, I'll pick up a couple of things first from, from your questions. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the the difficulty on, on defining first and third party situations even within the working groups, that's no surprise at all. I mean, how are we going to translate that discussion from that working group into something that my mum can understand? That's difficult and I think that that gets us into the firm area of user education. Um, what you mentioned about the advertisers not enjoying that massive take up um, in Firefox, that again doesn't surprise me either and I think I mentioned some of the opinions that, that perhaps I had earlier on in my presentation. I think the real interesting thing you raised, obviously, is e-readers. Um, so back in the 1980s in the United States, there was something that the FBI were running called the Library Awareness Program, uh, which um, basically accessed library records to see if there were uh, potential um, communist supporters checking out books based on their reading choices. And at that point, the security forces were accessing library records. So there was interaction with library databases and eventually the New York Times um, kind of blew the lid off of this and it was allegedly stopped, although the American Library Association never received any confirmation that it was stopped. 
Um, now, when it comes to e-readers, um, and not to get into the problems that libraries are actually having with publishers to actually secure access to e-books, the e-reader belongs to the user. So it is the user and not the library um, that is holding information on reading habits. So in some respects, we get one step further away from being able to influence anything to do with this situation. Um, we know that e-readers now can tell how fast you're reading. They can tell um, which bits of books that you skip based on your eye movement. They can tell which books you finish and which ones you don't. And all of this information is uh, apparently quite useful to, to, to some sorts of publishers, at least, who can then write you the perfect book that could be two or three paragraphs long, depending on your attention span, or could contain romance in particular ways. I mean, the actual potential of this is, is, is great in some respects. So there's, there's a lot of good potential here. But um, what really it comes down to, I think, is terms and conditions, which you quite rightly mentioned. Um, Corey Doctorow tells a fantastic story about buying a, uh, uh, downloading a, an e-book from Amazon. Uh, it was a short story, and the terms and conditions were 15,000 words, and the short story was 6,000 words. Um, nobody is going to read these things. So I would imagine that the vast majority of people who own e-readers are unaware of what information is being transmitted back. Um, and as you quite rightly point out, I haven't read any references in the reading I've done for this presentation about how potential legislation is going to pick this up. From a library perspective, we do not believe that having somebody peering over your shoulder whilst you're reading is um, in line with the principles that we bring to our professional work, but yet it will be the decision of individuals who buy e-readers as to what they're going to sign up to. So what we can do is the same as I mentioned in my presentation. It's about media and information literacy. It's about helping people understand the choices they make when they're accessing information and the implications of those choices. But um, to, to go back to something that, that Robert said as well, uh, and something which, which the publishers tell us all the time, and in this case I'm actually quite happy to quote them, not normally, but um, society is fluctuating, everything is happening so quick. This is still very much in its infancy. What we must ensure, I think, is that nothing gets completely locked in at this stage so that there is still room for a, a, a strong opt-out if you do not want your reading habits to be sent back up the line to your publishers or owners of the e-readers. So I would like to take this uh, opportunity to quickly welcome my co-host, Mrs. Uh, Francois Castex, who will also be holding the closing remarks. Um, we are in the middle of uh, challenges to the panel, so the introductory remarks were already made. Yes. Um, and uh, Mr. Van Eyck has an additional comment on uh, what uh, Stuart has been saying. Yes, thank you. Um, Stuart, you raised the point of the uh, strongness of the opt-out. And since we're discussing the self-regulatory framework in the EU at the moment, I would like to point out that it's by no way clear what the opt-out means in the current opt-out system. Does the opt-out mean it's bl I'm, when I see a uh, do not track signal flying by that I stop collecting the data, I throw it away, or do I still uh, retain the data but I'm not using it to offer a personalized ad? The thing is, if we learn from uh, the self-regulatory efforts in the US, at least the NAI code of conduct is very clear about what the opt-out means it means we're not collecting that data further. Whereas in the EU, that definition, that question of what the, how strong the opt-out is remains open. So, so if I can pick up the comments that Walter made, I mean, the first thing is, I, I think as the previous exchange shows, I, d I don't have a sense of any institution in Europe waiting. Uh, I think that uh, what, what my boss has said is we we would really like a W3C solution to come to market soon as part of the toolbox. I think that's very clear. Uh, but, but I'm not trying to badmouth either the W3C approach. I would only observe that <coughs> it's a global self-regulatory endeavor to fix a problem which in the EU is under the directive I'm in charge of. And no, W3C did not come to the European Union institutions before they started and said, do you guys want to suggest any stakeholders from Europe who should be involved or any um, views as to what the desirable goals are? So, so in terms of my approach to self-regulation, if you want to do global self-regulation, uh, half 
uh, half a billion is not uh, negligible in terms of the planet's population. You might pass through Brussels or send us an email and say what's going on. I, I, don't, I, I think that that sort of degree of joined upness for, for self-regulatory initiatives that will go global initially is quite important. We haven't got there yet. Um, on on the, the, the other point about legitimacy, from I mean, an important constitutional principle embedded since the Treaty of Rome was drafted is a certain agnosticism as to the best organization of societies. It, at the European Union level, we are paid not to take a view whether uh, communist, libertarian, or social market economies are good, bad, or excluded. And therefore, I personally, I think I have a duty to object to somebody who says that uh, regulated market economy behavior, which is not against the law, is illegitimate. It may be more or less legitimate than other goals, but I don't think I would buy onto a model that says the stuff that my organization does is legitimate and what these guys do is just business and so it's not legitimate. I think what we're trying to do here is a balance between what the 508 million citizens want in terms of e-readers, online commerce on the one hand, and personal and personal integrity and agency on the other. And it's really hard to do. And I actually think that we would get, especially in an election year, more traction on a European consensus around this if we went to a sort of slightly higher level and talked about those issues as they affect real people and try, because when it's sliced up, DNT, cookies, you know, 99% of the citizens of Europe don't follow that conversation. That's not a vocabulary that engages them. But you can frame these debates in areas where it does engage them. And I actually think the rights-based approach is a bit like DNT. It's, it's a small slice of sausage which only appeals to a minority audience. There is a more populist way of sparking this debate, uh, and then we might get a bit more traction. I just wanted to, to, Robert reminded me of, of one thing, which is that um, the library community has undertaken extensive analysis of the contracts being offered by um, e-readers. There's a group in the US called Readers First, um, which has a, a really extensive report which has just come out about the levels being offered by different vendors. And on April the 23rd, the European Library Associations are holding uh, a campaign day, the right to e-read and there's going to be a tremendous amount of material being produced in, in, in connection with that. So it's just that Robert sort of reminded me there that, you know, people aren't waiting around on this. The things are definitely in flux, but we, we have to keep making our positions clear, and that's what we're trying to do. An additional comment from uh, Walter van Holst. Uh, let me clarify that the WCC actually has a tremendous job in getting multiple stakeholders at the table and in being as agnostic as possible in, in the process. Uh, my remarks were mostly meant to say, well, we have all the, probably most of the stakeholders needed at the table, and their interests are so different that it's very hard to make any progress in, in a meaningful way. And what interests, most, in, interests me most, and I may have missed that in your answer, is what would be your own requirements of the outcomes of that group to either step in or to lean back? At, at what point are you sufficiently happy with the results of the, of the or the, the pace of the progress that the do not track effort and that does not necessarily require you to, in, to have a debate with the WC about that so if I may I, yeah I, mi I missed that point but what I'd like to say there is that this issue is a very good illustration of the principle that it's not self-regulation or legislation. This College of Commissioners uh, has proposed quite, quite ambitious data protection regulation, which will largely take over from the e-privacy directive and which uh, we have and are supporting. Uh, within that, we make explicit what I think is arguably the case already, which is a claim for global jurisdiction over the handling of European citizens' data. But in case people didn't understand that in California, we're now making it explicit. And I, I think that we then get to the sort of global governance challenges that we highlighted up front in the G8 in 2011 in Deauville. And again, if you didn't notice it then, you've certainly noticed it since Snowden. You're going to destroy the possible benefits of the internet if we don't 
fix those problems ex ante together at a global level. But on your point about um, what will make us move or not, I think Europe is moving. The question is, therefore, in this part of DNT, if there is, and my take on it is, if there is a solution out of W3C which operators get behind and which citizen groups seem to find potentially helpful, if only in closing off some parts of the problem, that will enable us to focus the political capital on fixing other parts of the problem. So it, it's, it's not either or. And, and that's why we're, we've never been waiting. OBA is not DNT, and the, the data regulation is not DNT. We're, we're moving on different things all the time. Yeah, if I may add to your question on, um, well, any negotiation is complicated, and um, I, I can give you two recent examples of negotiation. Um, uh, you need something to unlock it at some point, and it can be an external factor. When, when in the Commission we were negotiating the data protection regulation and the Parliament was negotiating, clearly the Snowden affair was one of the key external factors that made the Parliament go to saying, now we do it, nothing's going to be perfect. Uh, as Robert said, neither the law is going to be perfect, nor, nor anything else. And the other thing is, um, we, we're currently doing this cloud computing code of conduct as part of the cloud strategy together with DG Connect. And um, in there, it's, uh, uh, though, though we, we only have the, the, the big cloud players uh, at the table, it's very difficult to get uh, a consensus on that data protection issue. And I would say what helps is to have a benchmark and to have the regulator facilitating it. But in the do not track process, um, I'm not sure there is a clear benchmark, and I'm not sure that there is a clear also guidance from the regulator or, or, of where it should go. I'm not sure, I, I'm not I enough into the details to know whether the US government has a clear line from its various parts on it, uh, and, and our, uh, on all this, uh, and I think, well, but it's, it's neither easy, be it, be it a self-regulatory process or be it within within a, a democratic uh, assembly which has procedures that are standing for years and so on I, it's it's always difficult huh? so um, we have uh, one actor with us around today from uh, Beric, the uh, european collaboration association for telecommunications national regulatory authorities that i think has not been participating in the do not track working group at the uh, World Wide Web Consortium, and whom I know also suffer a lot of conflict of competences over the e-privacy directive, um, but which may perhaps be, as I understand our commission speakers, worsened by the data protection regulation. And so um, I'm very happy to uh, give the floor to Ola Bergström so that he can also add the contributions of telecommunications to this discussion. Um, well, I'm going to just a brief remark on, on regulatory competence and like Amelia said in, in the beginning here, we have uh, close to 10 telecom regulators in Europe with, with a competence in, in this area. Um, so I'm, I'm basically in two capacities. I'm representing Barrett, of course, but also uh, PTS, the Swedish NRA, who is also holding the chairmanship of, of Barrett for, for this year. Um, so coming from a regulator with a fairly strong competence or mandate in these issues, we very much see a problem with, with having so many regulators in Europe uh, with a similar mandate as, as, as we have, that there is no natural forum for discussion. Uh, it's difficult to exchange experience, to find joint positions. So I mean, we have, we have of course informal discussions with, between regulators, but I think this is not sufficient uh, for these discussions. So, so the division of mandate between, between data protection authorities and, and, and arrays causes problem for us as a regulator. Um, and even if we on a national level have a very good relationship with the, the data protection authority, I think a deepened cooperation on a European level would be much beneficial. Um, one question we discussed uh, with Amelia before, I mean, could Beric do anything in, the, in this area? Um, Beric as an organization has not been active at all in these, these questions. And 
it's always diff difficult to, to bring new, new issues into to organizations like Barrack when you have different mandates. I shouldn't say, I wouldn't totally rule out any Barrack involvement, but, but it will take some, some, some work to, to discuss this within Barrack, with stakeholders, with the Commission, and see if we can do anything in, in, in this area. So I, I, I wouldn't promise anything, but, but we, I mean, we as a regulator think this is a very important issue to discuss among the, the entire group of regulators, even those with, with uh, less ma mandate for than, than we have. So, so this is an interesting discussion for us. So thank you for, for inviting us to this, this discussion. I would like to invite um, um, Robert to uh, discuss that more closely because I think Barrick is more tied to DG Connect's activities than to DG, DG Justice. Um, um, I also uh, wanted to hear your points of views on um, how the Commission has been working to, to integrate Barrick and the national regulatory authorities for telecommunications more closely into the discussions of self-regulation, if they have taken steps to ensure that Barrick can effectively uh, constitute part of that discussion and what is the general uh, reasoning behind so, that. So if I start with the second question, um, I'm, I'm the Commission's representative on the Barrick uh, board or observer on the Barrick board. And uh, we work very closely therefore with the institution. The, the difficulty uh, is indeed that not everybody in the board, so not every representative of a national telco regulator has, I mean, this is just one example, they don't have the same scope of mandate. So some are doing data retention, some are not. Some are doing e-privacy, some are not. Some are doing broadcasting regulation, some are not. And in the world of convergence around internet technologies, Therefore, the question arises, uh, can we either have single mega regulators for everything internet, that might be a bit ramp revolutionary, or can we somehow organize a more joined up debate? And I think the more joined up debate is perfectly feasible, but it's a human to human issue. It means, I mean, crudely, for example, it means the, the, the PTS chair who's chairing Barrack having time also to sit with the Article 29 colleagues from time to time. Uh, to build an awareness of these different overlapping networks. And I think it's, it's one of the challenges of, um, of doing stuff at European level, that because different member states cut up the regalian powers of the state in different ways, it's quite hard to find the same people around the table all the time in many fields. So this is a complication, but we can deal with it. And I think that going forward, the logic would be that the e-communications regulatory space probably begins to look sideways more because the, the access to networks issue, which is the core business of the third package, is probably only one among several key drivers at the moment. On self-regulation, I think the, the, the same is true that in, in today's world, the Barrick mandate is about applying hard law, the third telecom. Uh, some regulators at national level, but it varies with culture and mandate, use self-regulatory techniques. I think there is space in all um, sectors and in all parts of Europe to, to do more about saying, if people come to us saying we're going to do it by self-regulation, what do they have to mean and how will we keep that debate honest? And that's where the, the new EU principles can help. So I think that's not something we've done in the past, but it's logical, almost as part of the community of practice I referred to at the beginning, to begin to ask hard law regulators to think about being part of a community of practice around self-regulation. Does, um, does anyone have any additional comments that they would like to bring in front of the panel? Um, first you and then no, yeah, yeah um, I'm Mike O'Neill I'm, I'm also a member of the Track and Protection Working Group and um, I just want to make a point that the do not track is a signal and it already exists most browsers implement it and to say that you need to wait for the W3C it's out there it's a signal but I don't I think the, Europe, the Commission, or somebody in Europe, could come up with a statement to say, this is what do not track means from a fundamental 
rights point of view from a European perspective. Um, and that's what we need. And as you know, and that's the external stimuli, the W3, which could be very useful for the W3C to order it in order to get to a, uh, a, you know, a, a, an agreement. And um, I think it's, it's called for. Yeah, I have a, a related question to what I was talking about earlier. One possibility in W3C is that the World Wide Web Consortium standardizes what the signal looks like, a way to say to the world, hey, don't track me um, from site to site, but that the W3C compliance standard, which is how you should respond to it, may be ignored, and the digital trade associations may come forward with their own version of um, how to respect um, a do not track signal. If it's anything like what was proposed last summer within the group, it could be a fairly weak standard. Um, so that you would still allow for a great deal of data collection and even behavioral advertising when do not track is turned on. If that's the end result, and there's definitely people who are pushing that as the end result of this process, what happens in Europe? I mean, do, I mean, we, we talked a lot about self-regulation on this panel, but I think, you know, as I pointed out and as Walter's pointed out, there's already a fair amount of law that pr could conceivably y be used um, in this area. So uh, you talk about self-regulation, I see more regulatory forbearance. Um, if, that, if, if a weak standard comes out or a weak standard is adopted by industry, is it your position that existing law is just so confusing and nebulous that Article 5.4, you're not really sure what it means, data protection directive, fairly high level, that we need to have a new law in Europe um, in order to address that? Or, or could the existing, if imperfect law, be used to, 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 to counter um, uh, a weak uh, do not track implementation? make the first response. I think that the, I would repeat what I've said, I don't think that the Barroso II proposal of data protection lacks ambition. Uh, Vice President Reddick, I mean, Nicola can say this more eloquently or with more mandate than me, but, you know, I think that she with her colleagues, the rapporteurs here, are trying hard to finish it, the April plenary lose. Uh, so I think that the question what will happen this side of the next elections is, is within that process. Beyond that, will we come back and say, like for example, will we come back and say in the context of fair e-commercial practice that um, a terms and conditions that requires tracking is abusive? We have a tradition of striking down abusive contract terms in consumer contracts, so it's conceivable it wouldn't be a constitutional revolution. There hasn't yet been a groundswell of opinion in favor. Could we say, that a failure to comply with a do not track signal from an identified browser is an unfair commercial practice. It's, it's possible in law to make these statements. And I don't see the problem as being a lack of political will. I think actually it's not clear that that's what consumers want. It's clear that it's what certain, if I may say so with all respect, activist organizations want. If you go out there and poll, the thing that shocked me most in the last six months is 70% of my fellow citizens think that the, the Snowden revealed degree of invasion is cool if the police think that's good for them. So, I mean, you know, you're looking at a, you're looking at a baseline reality, which is, it's not regulatory forbearance, it's citizen indifference. And if, if the European Parliament legislative debate doesn't change that before the end of May 2014, I suspect the next commission and the next parliament will not be uh, aiming for the skies either. In addition to that, um, I, I do like the, po the view point of view that the user is put central in this uh, discussion. And as we learned from the ebook discussion, um, the tools for the user uh, to have some kind of user control about their data collection and the data use uh, could be increased by uh, taking use of what comes out of the do not track process. And I, uh, I want to um, I go back to my uh, uh, introductionary in the opening, and it is, w what if the do not track is implemented within the ebooks? What would that mean? I mean, in the ebook, usually is just the browser. And the, 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 the point is, within the history of the ePrivacy Directive, it, it became clear that when we were discussing in 2009 the, this distinction between first and third party cookies, this was much technological focus debate on cookies. We're now talking about data flows for a specific use. And uh, to have the ability in the browser 
to show um, an expression from the user in an automated way um, might not disrupt this new ability of the technology. We, we don't want to have pop-up dialogue boxes uh, on e-readers asking for consent to trace you the movements of your eye and whether you've skipped a certain page. So it, it, uh, the usefulness of the building blocks within the Do Not Track protocol at the moment is that we can automate that wish of the user uh, maybe up to 80 or 90 percent and that make, make the new technology much more user friendly as well and it also enables innovation and it also enables uh, to make use and maybe monetize uh, the knowledge that comes through um, um, the use of this technology. There will be a lot of readers uh, that will give up some of their privacy in return for instance to get access to free um, uh, information. And uh, by studying these uh, opt-in um, groups, and maybe you can call them uh, loyal customers, you can gain enough knowledge uh, to, to improve your product and to monetize this better for us. But there also needs to be protection within the sensitive nature of the information people are consuming, whether they're reading uh, communist books or other political uh, oriented books. And when the technology has the ability uh, to do uh, something about that and implement it in the technological level. This is what I mean with a user-centric design for the developers, because in the end they have to create uh, this new technology. That may be, for me, the most uh, added value of the debate of what should we do with the outcome of a do not track. Yeah, no, I, I think we cannot say Yet, we're going to have a new commission, as you know, so we cannot say what, what the new commissioners will say. But um, I, I do believe into this approach where we have an horizontal regulation which sets out what are uh, the rights of the, the people and what are the, the, the obligation of, of the data controllers, and that it remains technology neutral. We see that the wide gap we have in the e privacy directive between well, the secret of communication, which is something that dates back to the Roman Empire, and uh, the cookie provision in the same article makes it sometimes a bit difficult. And so we, as DG Justice, we think that to have a, a single set of rules which apply to all sectors which, which are broad uh, and can be adjusted, together with self and co-regulation initiatives can be the solution. So. We think there is a lot of guidance already from, from uh, the Article 29 Working Party on, on behavioral advertising. It's quite clear uh, how Do Not Track could be, uh, could be linked to that guidance uh, and, and uh, taking together that guidance plus, what, plus the Do Not Track, you can see very well how uh, an implementation of uh, Do Not Track in a way that is compliant to to uh, the current laws, I don't think it's blocking to make, a, there's, there's no, it's not so difficult, uh, can happen. And I think it's quite clear for, from the existing guidance. And if that's not enough, it, it can be uh, further set out into a code of conduct from, from the industry that, that meets uh, the guidance of the Article 29 working part in the current laws. And there can be a discussion on this, and the Commission is happy to facilitate. The, the, the having more laws is, well, uh, up to the next commission, but, but uh, I would start from this myself. Because of the many interesting comments made here today, we've reached a time when we need to look more at the time. But I think that we can still um, take up comments from the audience. So if anyone has any particular remarks that they would like to see addressed or raised by the panel in this context, or if the panelists um, wish to make any additional remarks, this would be um, a good time. We have one gentleman in the back row. Could you please yourself. introduce yourself also when you... Uh, yes, my, my name is uh, Abt van Loon from the Netherlands, and I assist uh, self-regulatory initiative in the Netherlands, which I think is important to share briefly uh, with you, because it does a couple of things. It brings the individuals back in control over their personal data. It makes cookies, especially also tracking cookies, obsolete. And it has the support, wide support of the industry, 
because it provides for valuable data that the industry can use for their, for their purposes. And this initiative is called KIWI, Q-I-Y. And what it does is, um, and, and I can't go, of course, in too much detail, but the basic uh, thing that it does is it brings a, a trusted uh, privacy protection layer on to the internet, whereby um, each ind individual who chooses to have a, a digital identity gets a unique digital identity. And once this person, on the basis of all kinds of security rules, accesses his or her personal domain, this person will have access to the data that ha have exist of this person on the internet or uh, uh, on servers of all kinds of organizations that choose to participate. So uh, the basic idea is that companies who want to have or to collect personal data uh, have to subscri subscribe to the individual's personal data in order to be able to use it. So the individual, individual is in control of, of his uh, own data. And there's a test case go, uh, running in the Netherlands at the moment with major companies that invested already 15 million euros in this initiative. Um, um, the companies that participate have to follow the rules of a kind of trust framework. Uh, and there's a special foundation developing these standards and rules. Companies have to subscribe to the rules. And then they can, um, um, if the individual chooses uh, to do so, connect to this individual and the individual can choose which, what kind of data can be used by these companies, either anonymously or, um, or uh, identifiably. Um, we uh, already presented this initiative to DG Connect and DG Just in, uh, in, in last year and uh, together with, um, in a breakfast meeting at the European Parliament. Uh, in November last year, hosted by Mr. Kelly, it was also uh, presented in, in much more detail. Um, the reason why companies like this, uh, this system is because they also don't like tracking cookies and they, they it collects so much information that you're not sure whether it is uh, valuable and if it's, um, if, if it's um, correct information. Um, in, in this particular system, the information that the individual chooses to, to, to transfer to participating companies in the trust framework is always validated because the information comes from uh, uh, servers that already have collected information of these individuals. Um, as I said, it's, it's, it's too complicated to, to s in a few words to explain this, but I think it is worthwhile to, to monitor this initiative and, and perhaps to, uh, to look into it in more detail. So um, there's a different comment also at the back. Yes, um, my name's uh, Oliver Gray. I represent the European Advertising Standards Alliance, which promotes self-regulation, and also the European um, Digital Interactive Advertising Alliance, which um, oversees the administration of the ICON for uh, third-party behavioral advertising. Um, I just want to make a couple of comments, uh, one in general about self-regulation, since this, uh, this is about, you know, is it enough? Um, I was heartened by the comments on the panel about the use of self-regulation as part of the different instruments that are there. Um, I, I would appeal, though, to when we're concluding here, that we, we look to what we call better regulation, in which these different instruments are, are all used. There are part of getting it right for the ordinary citizen is using a number of instruments, legislation, self-regulation. Um, and if we look to the internet, the first things that were done there were done by what they call netiquette, which is a form of self-regulation, um, which is in advance of what we're doing now. So I think we need to have proportionate measures and these self-regulation and legislation need to be in, in the government's toolbox. So when we're looking to look at which measures we use, I'd be interested to, to understand, um, I heard from uh, DG Justice that they would look at self-regulation, but would you subscribe to the same types of understanding what we call effective self-regulation as what Robert Madeline set out in terms of 
having you know, clear sanctions involving stakeholders and so on, because I think that's kind of uh, would be interesting to understand how that conversation would take place. Um, secondly, I just wanted to say in terms of online behavioural advertising, we have a clear um, programme that's been set up uh, over a year in, in um, action. It provides both, um, it's technology neutral, it provides both a, um, it builds on the credible self-regulation of advertising, which means having codes, sanctions, independence, overview, and ensuring that stake stakeholders are involved with a technology solution, providing transparency, choice, and control for the average consumer. And there's a consumer awareness campaign, and the rules and procedures have been discussed in a round table, uh, which uh, Robert Madeline has um, actually chaired. <coughs> and we're moving to, to mobile. So I, I'd like that initiative to at least be known if you didn't know that that was happening. It doesn't respond to all the things that we're talking about today, but it is part of when um, Justin was talking about what's happening in Europe. It's uh, very similar to what the DAA does in the States and it you know, shows that we, we have something in place. So when we're talking about effective self-regulation, it's, uh, it's those types of solutions. So my appeal is when we're looking at this, can we please look at getting it right, looking at the toolbox which properly assesses the, the options that are there and provide space for effective self-regulation to take place. <coughs> so there was at least uh, uh, one question to our representative from DG Justice, and I see also that uh, Rob wants to make a comment. The commission is one, so uh, there's no, uh, on self-regulation, we 100% uh, agree with, uh, with uh, DG Connect, and we 100% agree with our Secretary General and all the guidelines that have been produced, and not only we agree, but uh, we have common self-regulatory initiatives, so uh, especially on uh, cloud computing uh, code of conduct. So, so I, I think, I, I don't know where those rumors come from that we would, disagree on, on something in this regard and, and as I explained uh, we strongly emphasized on to on uh, co-regulation and self-regulation in, in the data protection reform and this is what has been the most supported both in Parliament and Council. There was strong support in Parliament on this aspect which have been expanded and there was also strong support uh, even by, by the most reluctant member state on the data protection reform uh, on this aspect in Council. So there's no reason why we, we should not, not move forward. Uh, as I said in the beginning, if you go to the credit card payment self-regulation stuff, it's uh, thousands and thousands of pages, so there are some limits to what can go through this Parliament. Uh, it's already overloaded, I would say. So at some point, things also, also need to be, to be, to be solved in, in other places. Uh, 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 and we don't mind this as long as it's in line with, with principle, and that's why we're, we're laying down principles that have a broad scope in, in data protection. I have a follow-up question. Um, since we're discussing do not track and self-regulation today, uh, and I've also been involved in the OBA roundtables, I would be interested to see how uh, do not track would fit in the self-regulatory framework. Uh, because at the moment, it hasn't been really part of the discussion yet within the self-regulatory process. So with um, our time limits approaching their end, I will leave over to um, my colleague, Mrs. Francois Castex, for closing remarks. Um, she will speak in French, but you have translations in your headphones um, that are conveniently located, usually to your right. Merci Amalia, euh, je vous souhaite d'abord euh, la bienvenue à tous et puis je me félicite que vous soyez aussi nombreux dans cette euh, audition conférence que nous avons souhaité euh, co-organiser sur, euh, sur ce sujet. Je pense qu'il nous a beaucoup occupé en fin de mandature hein, et je crois qu'on euh, est loin d'avoir euh, bouclé euh, le débat et la réglementation euh, en ce qui euh, concerne ce, te, ce profilage et, le et la façon dont le citoyen est traqué euh, sur Internet. 
parce que les techniques euh, évoluent vite, parce que euh, nous avons euh, souvent du, du mal à appréhender toute l'ampleur euh, euh, du phénomène. Et euh, l'affaire euh, Prism, les révélations de Snowden ont été un véritable coup de tonnerre, puisque euh, nous ne soupçonnons pas, même si nous savions que euh, les États-Unis avaient un système de recueil de, de données et d'écoute, euh, l'ampleur de ce, de ce phénomène. Je crois que ça a été pour euh, les citoyens européens et les parlementaires euh, un, un choc assez, assez important. Alors, c'est vrai, euh, ça a été dit par un panéliste, peut-être que les citoyens ne se sentent pas concernés euh, par euh, les révélations euh, de l'affaire de, de Snowden et les écoutes, les pratiques de la NSA euh, parce qu'ils se disent que ce sont des mesures qui concernent la protection euh, du territoire, la lutte contre le terrorisme et donc moi, je ne suis pas concernée. Euh, L'ampleur euh, du phénomène, ce qu'il faut se dire, c'est que ça nous révèle ce qui est techniquement possible. Et ce qui est techniquement possible, c'est euh, de pouvoir euh, traiter euh, avec euh, des algorithmes euh, assez compliqués une masse de données, d'informations qui ne sont pas forcément des informations sensibles, qui ne se relèvent pas forcément euh, des données personnelles et qui, euh, organisées ensemble, euh, peuvent faire apparaître un profil euh, et révéler quelque chose euh, dans, selon les, les objectifs que l'on s'est euh, fixés. Alors, euh, déjà, ça pose un, un problème sur la protection euh, de la vie privée et des données personnelles, mais euh, dans les préoccupations que nous devons avoir, c'est aussi... Euh, et ça a été aussi dit dans, par, le, par le panel, euh, ce, en ce qui concerne la protection du consommateur. Hein, parce que je crois que de là, en la matière, ce sont des mêmes pratiques et euh, des mêmes types de techniques qui sont mis en œuvre avec des finalités et des objectifs différents. Les uns pour euh, l'espionnage, l'écoute, euh, l'utilisation d'éléments euh, de la vie privée et de, de données euh, protégées, et d'autres à, euh, à des fins commerciales. Et nous devons avoir euh, des types de législation euh, qui s'adaptent à ces différents, euh, à ces différents euh, cas, à ces différentes euh, finalités. Nous sommes en train de conclure un paquet euh, législatif sur la protection des données personnelles euh, avec euh, nos collègues euh, Albrecht notamment euh, qui fait un travail euh, extrêmement précis euh, dans, dans, dans les détails euh, qui permet de définir ce qu'est une donnée personnelle et euh, comment on peut protéger le citoyen, l'internaute euh, par rapport à la à la protection de ces données personnelles. Mais euh, quand on travaille ensuite sur euh, des directives sur les pratiques commerciales euh, sur Internet, sur euh, l'e-commerce, je crois que nous ne devons pas oublier tout ce que nous disons, tout ce que nous avons débattu, tout ce que nous avons déposé comme amendement sur le paquet données personnelles, mais l'avoir aussi en tête dans la mesure où l'on sait maintenant, sans non plus en, en mesurer complètement l'ampleur, euh, que des données personnelles et d'autres données qui ne sont pas forcément sensibles peuvent être utilisées à des fins commerciales, y compris à des fins de pratiques commerciales déloyales. Et c'est là aussi qu'il faut que l'on puisse, que l'on soit en capacité de distinguer dans la législation ce qui est une pratique commerciale normal, on va dire, de publicité, de ciblage d'un public de consommateurs et ce qui devient pratique commerciale déloyale. Nous avons des, euh, des arguments, excusez-moi, des arguments euh, et des, un, un, un arsenal euh, législatif et réglementaire 
pour définir ce qui est, par exemple, une, une pratique commerciale déloyale, que ce soit au niveau européen où on avance de plus en plus, que ce soit dans chacun de nos États membres. On n'a pas attendu aujourd'hui pour savoir ce qu'est une, une pratique commerciale déloyale. Mais par contre, avec les nouveaux outils numériques, euh, il faut que l'on affine la, euh, la définition. Alors, en ce qui concerne ces pratiques commerciales déloyales, moi, j'ai euh, un petit peu posé le débat euh, au sein de l'Union européenne sur l'utilisation de l'adresse IP, l'IP tracking, euh, pour euh, cibler et adapter le prix en fonction des, euh, euh, de l'intérêt manifesté par le consommateur sur un produit acheté, hein, euh, notamment sur la vente de, de, de billets d'avion. Il est évident que cette adresse IP, elle n'est, qui est définie comme une donnée personnelle et donc à ce titre protégée, la, la Commission européenne m'a répondu de façon très claire là-dessus, l'adresse IP, euh, en toute seule, n'apprend pas grand-chose, à part qu'elle elle identifie un ordinateur. Donc, elle est utilisable que si on y ajoute un cookies qui va aller chercher, qui va aller espionner sur, par exemple, un historique de navigation. Ou si on y ajoute euh, un, des cookies qui font des recueils de données euh, personnelles, achats, euh, d'autres éléments que je, que je pense la, la liste ne peut pas être exhaustive, qui vont profiler un type de... Euh, de consommateurs et éventuellement, ne serait-ce que la géolocalisation, on voit que euh, il y a des euh, aux États-Unis, au Canada, euh, la géolocalisation est utilisée pour euh, pour euh, euh, ajuster le prix à, au lieu de résidence d'un utilisateur et d'un consommateur. Donc, euh, à ce moment-là, si le prix est ajusté en fonction soit du profil de la personne, soit de l'endroit où elle habite, il y a euh, pratique commerciale déloyale. Et euh, c'est en tout cas ce que euh, m'a confirmé la, la CNIL, la Commission nationale informatique et liberté, que j'ai consulté à l'issue de, euh, de la réponse de la Commission européenne. Mais, encore une fois, euh, le débat, je pense, ne fait que commencer parce que euh, les entreprises et le e-commerce sur Internet euh, contre-argumentent à ces, euh, ces efforts de, de contrôle que nous, que nous proposons par une notion de euh, l'intérêt légitime à agir. Alors évidemment, du point de vue des, des commerces, du e-commerce, euh, ces méthodes de profilage euh, de l'offre commerciale et des consommateurs est un intérêt à agir parce qu'elles peuvent ajuster leur offre commerciale. À quel moment cela devient une pratique déloyale euh, Dans euh, la, le paquet législatif sur la protection des données personnelles comme dans euh, la directive sur le e-commerce, moi je propose que l'on mette la limite sur euh, la notion de consentement explicite de l'utilisateur et de l'internaute. Et je crois qu'à euh, ce moment-là, on peut euh, avoir euh, sérieusement une législation qui va protéger l'internaute consommateur et, d'autre part, qui va maintenir euh, toutes les innovations que l'on pourrait euh, avoir en matière de e-commerce à partir du moment où un, un, un consommateur dit bah, « moi, je ne veux pas » être traqué, je ne veux pas être profilé et je ne veux pas recevoir des offres commerciales qui sont établies en fonction de ce que euh, vous, vous supposez qui, me, qui va me convenir et que, et que vous supposez que j'ai envie d'acheter, de ce que j'ai envie d'acheter. Voilà. De la même façon qu'un euh, citoyen, un consommateur peut se soustraire dans la vie réelle euh, à des, euh, euh, des publicités qui sont adressées, qui lui sont euh, remises de façon plus ou moins forcée. De la même façon, dans le monde euh, virtuel et dans le, dans le commerce virtuel, 
il faut protéger euh, la euh, volonté euh, du citoyen consommateur de dire « moi, je ne veux pas être l'objet et être la cible de ce type de pratique commerciale. Voilà. Je ne veux pas que ce, soit, que ce soit fait à mon insu. » Et là-dessus, euh, je ne pense pas qu'il euh, puisse y avoir de l'autorégulation. Je crois que euh, c'est là que une, la responsabilité du législateur euh, est entière et que le législateur doit prendre sa responsabilité quand il y a des intérêts à ce point divergents et même contradictoires. Il faut que le législateur tranche et dise quels sont les intérêts qu'il va défendre. Est-ce que c'est les entreprises ou est-ce que c'est le consommateur euh, Il ne peut pas y avoir d'autorégulation dans ce domaine-là. Voilà. This was our last remark. You are free to leave. <laughs>